So we've got grass clippings that are being placed in a bin and then uh, they're decomposing, exciting. So we are given a function that represents the amount that are remaining in the bin, A of T. And so we wanna find the average rate of change of A of T on the interval from zero to 30. And so an average rate of change, this is just a slope. So for part A, we just need to find A of 30 and subtract A of zero and divide it by 30 minus zero. So A of 30, you just get by plugging that in. And you know, 0.931 to 30 is times 6.687, and then A of zero is just gonna be 6.687 divided by 30. This comes out to be negative 0.197 pounds per day. Any questions or issues with part A there? Average rate of change. What was the point value for that? Uh, it's just one point. Okay. All right, part B says a find a prime of 15. That should also be easy. You just have the calculator, so have your calculator evaluate a prime of 15 for you. Um, that came out to be negative 0.164. So what that tells us is that it says using correct units interpret the meaning of that value. So that is once again a pounds per day. And we should say that the that's just the, the amount of clippings in the bin is decreasing at 0.164 pounds per day. And that was worth two points, one for the number and one for the explanation with the right units. Any questions or issues there on part B? I feel like that one was pretty easy too. All right, part C. What did Percy ask us for? To find the average amount of grass clippings in the bin. So that's just the average value of this function from zero to 30. Well, the average value of a function is one over B minus A times the integral from A to B of that function. So all you gotta do is have your calculator evaluate the integral from zero to 30 of A of T, and then you need to divide it by 30, which gives you 12.145. And that was worth two points, one for the setup and one for the correct answer. Good or no? Any questions on part C? So that uh, right there was the time, 12 point whatever was the time or was that? Oh, sorry, that's, yeah, yeah. that's for the integral. Sorry, this asked us, I was, this not, what did it ask? It said, find the time at which the amount is equal to that. So you had to, sorry, this is, that's my fault. You had to, you had to get the integral and you had to um, figure out when A of T is equal to that. And that happened at T equals 12 point, whatever it was, 415. That's my fault, sorry. Because um, it says to find when the average amount is equal to the actual amount. So take the average value, set it equal to the function a of t, graph y equals this number, graph a of t, they intersect at 12.415. Sorry about that. Okay, thanks. It's good or no? Yeah. Yeah. All right, part D. Uh, said for t greater than 30, they want us to use a linear approximation to a at t equals 30 to model the amount of clippings in the bin. They say that's better than this little uh, exponential that they've got. So we're going to use L of t to predict the time where there will be a half pound of grass clippings remaining in the bin. So to use the linear approximation, that means we need to do a of 30, right? That's the function evaluated in our center of approximation. 
plus a prime of 30 times, normally use x, but since we're using t in this problem, times t minus 30, right? The function at a plus the function's derivative at a times x minus a is linearization. So this should be our linear approximation. Um, and a of 30, you should be able to get as 0.782928. A prime of 30, you should be able to get as negative 0 0.055976 times the t minus 30. And we wanted to know when does that equal, what did we want to know? When it equals 0.5. So when does that equal 0 0.5? So you'll graph this, you'll graph y equals one half, see where they intersect. And it looks like they intersect at t equals 35.054. And that was worth four points. So two points for this expression, one point for setting it equal to a half, and one point for getting the answer. Good or now? Any issues there with number seven? Nope. All right. Let's look at number eight. Okay. So um, the question was why why did I said equal to a half just because that's what it says. Find the time and there will be a half pound of grass clippings in it. So set that equal to a half. That makes sense. Cool. All right. So next problem here. Uh, twice differential functions f and g. They're giving us values of f f prime g and g prime. We want to find the x coordinate of each relative minimum of f on the interval from negative two to three. So first off, we need to find um, when we have critical values, right? Um, for for f, right? So critical values for f were when it's equal to zero. So it looks like that occurs at negative one and positive one. And then what do we need to happen? We need to have a sign change. So from a negative one, the derivative goes from negative to negative, no sign change. But at one, the derivative goes from one or from negative to positive, means we have a sign change. So we should have a, I mean, it should be a minimum because the function f goes from decreasing to increasing there. Right? And we'll note that it is decreasing there. So we have a minimum at x equals one, your justification would be there's a critical value there and the derivative goes from negative to positive, therefore f goes from decreasing to increasing. You'd want to write it out in words, I'm just abbreviating it here for the sake of time. Uh, yeah, you can use a sign chart as your justification, that's fine. And part A there was just worth one single point. Um, part B, we want to know why there must be a value where the second derivative of f is equal to zero between negative one and, uh, and one. And so that's going to be, we call it the mean value theorem, or it's specifically Rolle's theorem. Um, for part B, we can say that since we're talking about the second derivative, f prime is continuous and differentiable. We know that because it says f is a twice differentiable function, which means that f prime is also differentiable. So f prime is continuous and differentiable. And if we look for f prime of one minus f prime of negative one over one minus negative one, all that equals zero. And so by the mean value theorem or by Rolle's theorem, f double prime of c equals zero on negative one to one. Good or no? 
we have to explicitly state like which theorem we use each time or can we just like give a like a general description like of the theorem and that would be fine or do we have to say like by intermediate value theorem by mean say value, by theorem. Mean value theorem you have to yes their their scoring guidelines explicitly saying explanation using mean value theorem so okay you need to state the correct theorem yeah. um would there would you not be able to use the intermediate value theorem since it goes from um negative to positive and then like f of c equals zero would mean that there's like i thought i don't know i use the intermediate value theorem is that not correct you cannot use the intermediate value theorem because this was talking about f double prime of c and uh -huh. so if you had values of that double prime and they went from positive to negative between negative one and one then for sure you could use it but you don't have any values of f double prime. You only have values of f and f prime. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Cool. Yep. All right, part C says we got the function h of x, where h of x is the natural log of f of x. We want to find h prime of three. So h equals natural log of f of x. So first off, let's find h prime of x. Well, natural log of a function is 1 over that function times the derivative of that function. So this is f prime over f. So h prime of 3 ought to be f prime of 3 over f of 3. And we have a chart for that. f prime of 3 is a half, so we have 1 half divided by seven. Or one fourteenth. And they gave three points for that one, two points for the correct H prime and one point for the correct answer. Everybody good with part C there? Yep. Okay. And part D says evaluate the integral from negative two to three of f prime of g times g prime dx. I said from two to three? No, negative two to three. Of f prime of g of x times g prime of x dx. I assume I wrote that correctly. Yeah. So one thing we should first off note this should look fairly familiar. What is this term, f prime of g times g prime? Where have we seen that before? Chain rule? Exactly. That's the derivative of a composition of two functions. That's the der derivative of f of g of x. Now, if you didn't quite recognize that, life will go on. Um, but we would note that we'd have to do a u substitution here. We'd let u equal g of x, right, if we needed to. I'll write this off the side, but you could let u equal g of x, and then du would be g prime of x dx. So then this could become an integral of f prime of u du, and then you'd have to figure out what, you know, if u is g of x, we'd have to find out this would be g of negative 2 to g of 3 for your limits. And then it would just become capital F of, or not capital F, but just F of u from g of negative 2 to g of 3. But either way it works. Um, and so here, we're going to do the exact same thing. We need to find what's g of 3. So we go back here to our chart. g of 3 was 1. So this is, well, we'll write it this way. We'll write f of g of 3 minus f of g of negative 2, which equals f of, I just said g of 3 was 1, I think, right? And then g of negative 2 is negative 1. And f of 1 is 2, and f of negative 1 is 8. So we should get 2 minus 8 which should be six. And that was worth 
three points as well. Um, two for correctly getting the integral and one for correctly getting the answer. Isn't that negative six? What was that? Isn't that negative six? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two minus eight is definitely negative six. Yeah, I can I can subtract. <laughs> Any other questions on that one? Besides my arithmetic inadequacies. Sure. Back to slide eight. Yep. Anybody, any questions on those two so far? Oh. All right, and one last one to go through before we take our quiz here. We got a chart of values for T and the number of ounces of um, coffee in a cup. Uh, we're using a coffee maker here. First thing we wanna do is approximate C prime of 3.5. So for part A, to find C prime of 3.5, we're just going to find the average rate of change between three and four. So that would be 12.8 minus 11.2 over four minus three, which, what does that come out to be? It looks like that should be just 1.6, right? And it says indicate units of measure. So we're talking about ounces for our numerator and minutes for our denominator. Good or no? What was the point value? Just one? I know actually they gave you two points for that. They gave you one point for 1 1.6 and one point for the units. All right, part B, is there a time between two and four where C prime of T is two? Well, we don't have values of C prime, so we have to use, uh, we have to attempt to use the mean value theorem. We can't use intermediate value theorem. So between two and four, first off, we know that C of T <laughs> is continuous and differentiable. It states that in the problem, it's a differentiable function, so it must be continuous and it's also differentiable. And so we just look for C of, four minus c of two over four minus two and c of four is 12.8 minus 8.8 over two that's four over two which is two and so yes by mbt the average rate of change is equal to two on that interval so somewhere on that interval according to the mean value theorem since the function is continuous and differentiable the instantaneous rate of change must be two on that same interval somewhere. Good or now? How many points? All oh, right. Um, I don't know. Um, two. One for this setup and one for this. Everybody good? All right, part C. Oh, let's see. Um, somebody had a question about the mean value theorem. So when writing out the mean value theorem, it's always gonna be that the original function is continuous or differentiable. So um, for this particular problem, because we're talking about why C prime might equal to the antiderivative of C prime, right? The, the function that gives us this as its derivative, C is the one that needs to be continuous and differentiable. We looked back, let's see, if we look back at this one, we used the MVT to prove that the second derivative was equal to something. So the antiderivative of the second derivative is the first derivative. So we had to say that it was continuous and differentiable. So it just depends on what, you know, what function you're trying to prove the value for. 
you got to go one degree above that to use the mean value there. And that function is the one that has to be continuous and differentiable. Cool. All right. So for part C, let's see, what were we doing here? Using a midpoint sum, three subintervals of equal length from the data here, we're going to approximate the value of the integral from one to six um, of C of, T, or sorry, the integral from zero to six of C of T uh, divided by six. So this ought to be one sixth, and then our integral of C of T using a midpoint Riemann sum means we take the midpoint of each interval. Each interval has a length of two. The midpoints are nicely given to us. So that'll be 5.3 times two. Plus two times 11.2 plus two times 13.8. For the value of five. And then we're dividing it all by six. Um, so let's see, let's do some arithmetic here. What does that all come out to be? Let's see. 30.3, a third of 30.3, so 20. Okay, so that should be 10.1. And this is 10.1 ounces because we've. Um, and, and what is this value? This is a value of. That's just what this represents. This is the average ounces of coffee in the cup on zero to six. So you don't take the midpoint of like zero and 8.8, .8, you take the middle value on the chart. So yep. it wouldn't be 4.4. No, they want you to use these values. Oh, I just circled the wrong ones. They want you to use these ones. They've given you those data points, so that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Don't you have to average it though, like, because the graph could not be like linear to where? Yeah, I mean, this is an approximation. Okay. Not perfect, but, but yeah, they want you to they want you to use the midpoints that are given. So that that's why it's. I mean. I see they say, you know, indicated by the data and the table. I mean, yeah, I could see you could average those, but they want, this is a better representation of what's happening throughout than these two values are. Okay. So. Yeah, if I ever ask you if the values there are given, always use those values at the midpoint. They, they ask you that on the AP test. Um, and this part was worth three points, one for the sum, one for making, for doing the stuff right and dividing by six, and one for the explanation. Can you ever get the explanation point, even if you get like the wrong answer, yes. but you, oh, you can, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just because you can't do arithmetic doesn't mean that you don't understand calculus, and they will not penalize right. you for inability to add or subtract. I mean, other than... They will because they'll penalize you for that, but not in terms of conceptual understanding. All right, um, part D says the amount of coffee is modeled by this function. So they give us a new function to represent it. Um, we want to find the rate at which the amount of coffee in the cup is changing when t equals five. So that just means we need to find the derivative of this at t equals five. So if b of t was, um, uh, now I've already forgotten what it was. What was it? 16 minus 16 e to the negative 0.4t. So we want to find the derivative of that. 16 will go away. So we'll negative 16 is our constant out in front times e to the negative 0.4t times the negative 0.4. So that ought to become positive 6.4 e to the negative 0.4t. And they want you to evaluate that at t equals five. So 6.4 e to the negative two. Or if you want 6.4 over e squared, and I'm not sure if they asked for units or not, but be ounces per minute. If you gave 6.4 as a fraction, would that be fine? Sure. Okay. 
Yep, not a problem at all. And that one was worth two points, one for the right expression here for B prime and one for the value. Everybody good? Any questions there?